I've known uh, the work of Norval Morrisseau pretty much all my life. Um, you know, growing up in northern Ontario and down on Manitoulin Island, I've seen a lot of his uh, his work. And I remember the very first book I ever saw, I guess, was um, Windigo. And I remember there was a, it was uh, edited stories, um, Tales of Windigo, that was done by Schwartz and illustrated by Norval Morrisseau. And I always loved Morrisseau's imagery. Um, I also was very familiar as well with um, the rock art paintings of Northern Ontario as well. I've traveled into many remote lakes in Northern Ontario and I remember seeing, um, you know, the red ochre outlines of deer and uh, geese, moose, wolves, shaman figures. Um, and I always recognized immediately that there was a connection between that sacred art and Morisot. Um, so growing up in that environment, I was well aware that uh, Morisot was uh, a very, very important figure in terms of drawing imagery into his work to create really a whole new aesthetic of woodland, what became woodland art. Um, the dark outline is very prevalent in the rock art that you would see. Uh, the translucency or the x-ray type of vision that uh, people see within the work where they have the spirit lines and you can actually see the spirit line of the bear drawn into the imagery, uh, power symbols emanating from it. All of that really comes from traditional Anishinaabe art. Um, you would see that in Medewin, which is a spiritual society. Medewin teachings um, uh, were originally on birch bark, etched birch bark. And I remember back in the 1990s, I had the opportunity to meet Norvell and show him the Selwyn Dudney collection, which was housed at the Indian Art Center at Indian Northern Affairs. And within that, there were fragments of birch bark scrolls with etchings on them. And Norvell had painted on top of them. And so it was beautiful because there was the, the original etching underneath and then Morisot's figurative drawings on top of it. So those, those, I asked him about those particular fragments and he said that they were from his grandfather. So Morisot uh, acknowledged that that imagery comes from the Medewin scrolls. So that transparency or that x-ray vision um, goes very, very far back into uh, traditional teachings of the Medewin, which is a spiritual society. Right, well, if you look at any of his figures, um, the way that uh, motion and spirituality is, uh, is depicted is through uh, line work. So the outline itself that Morisot uses, a very dark outline, is really the containment of the figure itself. And embodied within that figure, or whether it's an animal um, or a fish or a human, they will have a transparency to them. So the outline defines the figure. Inside the figure you'll see lines which will run usually from the mouth and downward. And that really talks about the spirit. It's a reference, direct reference to the spirit within the individual. You'll see lines emanating out in almost a squiggly kind of a, of a motif coming out from an object. And that's depicting motion. So the way that Morisot animated his work was through line work, depicting those figures moving, the vibration, the spirituality, the life force within an object or within, it can be an object as well because in the Ojibwe language, Nishnabe language, um, some objects which we would consider inanimate are actually animate. They have a spirit. And there's two ways of saying within the Ojibwe language, um, identifying things. One thing is animate, one thing is inanimate. So uh, within the language itself, it embodies this motion of spirituality. In French, you have masculine, feminine. In Ojibwe, you have animate and inanimate. But animate does not necessarily refer to only living human forms as we would see it, because spirituality is within all of creation. Some rocks, for example, are alive. Um, so plants would also be another one that would be animate as well. So Morisot was well aware of that, and that comes into his, his imagery. That goes directly back to the Medewin, on those large birch bark scrolls, which were really monomic symbols that really talked about um, the spirituality, talked about the prayers, talked about the communication between beings. All of them were done in pictographs. And within there you will see life forces and lines of communications transfer a spiritual power 
uh, between objects. Morisot's grandfather was in the Medewan. He was aware of that. And so Morisot recognized that and brought it forward into his artwork. Um, I always found the black line very containing itself in terms of, and, uh, and you know, I think that Morisot was looking at it as that is the being and then there's the power. Later on he starts to, it gets a little bit more loose and you get that movement through the portals and you get those movements of, uh, of spirituality outside of the body. But the original black line outline really goes back to the original etchings as that you would see on birch bark. I think that Morisot's work in terms of the woodland school really can be sort of, early work can be categorized into two strong influences. Morisot had Medewan teachings from his grandfather, Moses, and he also had Catholicism, Catholic teachings from his grandmother, and he was raised with both. So I th always thought that spirituality for Morisot was broader, and it comes out in his work. You know, you see the Medewan, you see Catholicism, you see Ekenkar. So you see all of that come together. So Morisot's spirituality um, was uh, a very broad-based spirituality, and he drew from all sources. Um, the imagery that is my particular favorite period would be in the 1970s, and the work uh, such as the one behind me, which is uh, an Indian Jesus Christ. And Morisot um, drew a lot of the color imagery in here from the stained glass in churches. So those are, that's an actual reference to the church, the stained glass, the color that one would see within that. So you have the Medewan imagery in the early work on the birch bark and um, hide paintings and Thunderbird early work, brown craft paper work, very, very strong Medewan influence, rock painting. Then in the 1970s, you start to see him get into more of the um, stained glass type of imagery. So those are really two strong elements, and they, they, they go pretty much through his whole work, but the stained glass really sort of defined the Woodland School uh, for Norval Morisot. Uh, another important uh, offshoot of the Woodland School is the Manitoulin School of Painting, which uh, was uh, developed early on by influences to Norval Morisot. Um, somebody from uh, Chagin First Nation, which is my community, Martin Panamik, Blake DeBossigi, Leyland Bell, uh, a lot of these uh, young painters um, started painting in a stylistic uh, imagery, very much like Norval Morisot. This particular image beside me is a fairly recent one, but it's by Blake DeBossigi. And you can see that um, it still is along a legend style of painting. This particular painting is called Singing My Song, and it's a recent work. And you can see the elements um, uh, to Morisot's work, um, but also, it, as I mentioned before, it links back to traditional um, Anishinaabe um, cultural arts and uh, spirituality and cultural practices. Uh, when you look at this particular work, uh, Blake has uh, included the floral imagery, which relates directly to the plants having a, um, a, uh, a life force as being alive. And they are also uh, very, very similar to the beadwork motifs that you would find in traditional Anishinaabe beadwork. Um, you will also see uh, the plants vibrating, and if you look very, very closely on either of the flowers and on the leaves, you'll see tiny little movement lines. And this is depicting that these plants aren't just animate, they're actually alive. You will also note, uh, you are actually seeing the singing taking place. You're seeing the voice emanating as a power coming out of the mouth of the singer and you're seeing it um, expanding into the environment around it and you'll also see the movement depicted by again by these movement lines. Um, this goes back to Morisot's paintings but even goes farther back into the Medewan birch bark scrolls where you actually see power lines emanating from the uh, objects themselves. 
Um, even uh, even in, within the painting, there's small buds that are, are, are appearing, and everything is animate. Everything is moving here. That is the spirituality. But look at the beautiful, um, tight, stylized line work. Um, he's got black outlined, like, very much like Morisot, but there's a beautiful gradation that takes place, which is very different than Morisot's. Morisot's lines are very thick, very uneven. These are very even. And then you'll see the beautiful, uh, subtle gradation of color emanating internally until you come into a very powerful, lighter color or a white. Uh, same with the hide imagery around here. It'll go from uh, red and black and then into the brown. Same with the leaves. You'll go from a black outline into red into a darker green and into a lighter green. So all of this um, really is very, very uh, depictive of the Manitoulin School of Painting, which has originated James Simon or Misha Benizma is another painter uh, that, uh, that would be classified as a Manitoulin School painter. And so this whole school developed um, based on an influence of Norval Morisot, and it developed into a very distinct uh, genre of painting. Uh, very different. It's a, it's a lot more tighter than Morisot's. Morisot's is very loose. Um, the Manitoulin school developed into a very, very refined um, painterly, higher sort of like a, a painterly quality, I think. His influence is, uh, is still, I think, um, uh, felt today in many younger artists. You can walk pretty much anywhere in an urban center in Canada and you can see his influence. Uh, somebody selling art on the street, for example, will be in a, in a Norbel Morisot style. Uh, other, other individuals, Roy Thomas, uh, Benjamin Chichi, um, so many other artists followed in his footsteps. All the Kakagamics, uh, Goyce Kakagamic, and there's so many artists that followed in that whole school of the woodland uh, painters. And, um, you know, he came together with another group that was very important, the Indian Group of Seven, which was started by Daphne Ojig in Winnipeg. And uh, so his contribution uh, to contemporary Canadian art has been immense. And it's interesting that it took Canada 126 years uh, to have a solo artist exhibited at the National Gallery of Canada. And I don't think there could have been a better choice than Norbel Morisot as the very first solo exhibition of an Aboriginal artist in Canada. Seeing Norvell paint, uh, the imagery that he did paint, seeing the imagery uh, such as the uh, Indian Jesus Christ series, the shaman series of works, uh, seeing his referencing to the floral motifs of Nishnabe, uh, cultural arts, to see the spirituality, understanding that the all all the um, imagery such as animals and plant life and people are imbued with spiritual power is reflected within the Ojibwe language of animate and inanimate. Seeing the work that Norvell was producing at that particular time when I was young in the 1960s was so important to giving me a sense of cultural pride um, and seeing his work influenced me to also want to contribute to the production of artwork that would reflect not only my own experience as an Anishinaabe man, but also as a community of people. The importance of maintaining that traditional knowledge and bringing that forward into a contemporary reality that was relevant and is relevant to us as we live today. Whether you're Mi'kmaq, whether you're uh, Algonquin, whether you're um, Cree or Blackfoot, looking at those cultural attributes that are so important to you and seeing how those elements of spirituality and, and uh, cultural iconography can be relevant and brought into a contemporary setting. That's really what Morisot was doing. And it's something that when you look at his work, you recognize that Norvell is telling us, look around you, see what's important now, and bring those gifts forward. Um, as I mentioned, this line work and this, this motion that takes place, 
appears in Morisot's work, and there's a very good image uh, in the exhibition catalog of uh, Mishapishu, who is a, uh, a water spirit, and Morisot actually uses lines emanating out from the figure itself as power symbols, life force, movement, energy emanating from that. So again, this links directly back to this notion of power. And as I mentioned, within the Anishinaabe language, you talk about things as having a spirit or not having a spirit as animate or inanimate. So the translation of the image is very clear for Anishinaabe speaker. When they see the image, they know that, that it is animate, it is real, it is, it is live. Um, and the X-ray quality which you see within Morisot's work, especially on this particular image of Mishapishu, relates back to the birch bark scrolls. He is directly referencing here uh, the uh, Medewin and the song lines and the imagery that takes place within that spirit. You can see within that 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 figure all of the life force that take all the life force that takes place within it. And there's um, another image of the of a Mishapishu where he actually includes the figures, little human figures internally, which are figures that were directly taken from birch bark scrolls of the Medewin teachings. When you're looking at Morisot's work, especially works uh, where there are human figures within it, animals and uh, fish, what he's really talking about here is the different levels of reality. So there's the sky world, and there's the middle world, and there's the underworld. So those three elements are pretty much uh, common to his larger works where he's uh, showing uh, figures within a landscape. Uh, and in this case, we can see that there are, um, there are underwater uh, birds swimming, there's fish swimming here. This is representing the underworld. And then you have the middle world where humans and animals will walk upon the earth. And then you have the sky world, which is the world of spirits. And in there you'll have birds depicting like a thunderbird or you'll have other uh, um, flight type of figures that depict that, that reality. Um, so he's talking about the spirituality that is prevalent um, throughout all of creation. And we talk about the, the earth as being, as being the middle plane, and then we talk about the underworld, and we talk about the sky world. This particular one, again, is, is dealing with uh, what we would call, I would call this a dreaming. It's a dreaming. Uh, this, is the, this is a figure, the reclining figure on the bottom, who is eyes are closed, resting very peacefully, and then you'll see this whole realm, this dream world appear. And within it carries all of the information of knowledge that he would have access to as a shaman. He would have access to the underworld spirits, uh, such spirits as the Mishapishu, those types of, uh, of underworld, um, uh, what he would call demigods. Uh, early on in his career, he called them demigods. Also, you would have access to um, the sweat lodge itself here, which is depicted in the center, or a, or a healing lodge. Could be also a shaking tent. He depicted those types of, of portals where people would go to garner power, garner renewal, healing within the, within the, in the lodge. This particular image has a very blue reference to it, which is direct link influence and reference to Ekankar. And uh, then around it you have the plant life, very, very prevalent around it, which are the medicines that the shaman would use to heal for um, garnering uh, certain states upon which to receive that knowledge. So he's referencing all of the importance of the berries and the plants and the medicines that would grow on the earth itself. Um, and also again the the winged figures uh, representing the sky world and the ability of that person to travel. Um, the snake is often very prevalent within his work. It can be uh, an evil and it also can be a good force. So it really depends on, on how he depicts it. Um, I know in one particular image he uses the snake as devouring him. It's the artist 
um, again, dealing with his demons, so to speak. Um, but again, also the, the, the snake itself uh, does not necessarily have to be a force of evil, it can also be a force of good. This particular uh, to work is, again, um, man transforming into Thunderbird. And um, again, the Thunderbird being a very powerful mythical figure, also Morisot's name being uh, Copper Thunderbird, um, really talks about um, the, the artist and Morisot as shaman transforming into the Thunderbird. Um, the shaman itself, um, uh, in many cultures, uh, including Nishnabe culture, has the ability to transform oneself, to take on any form that one needs to um, achieve that type of a power necessary uh, to bring healing uh, and well-being to people. And in this particular one, he more so actually uh, transforms into the Thunderbird itself. Although it says man, I really believe it's more so a very much an autobiographical uh, depiction of himself as transforming, seeing his life transforming as a Nishnabe Nani man, transforming into this, uh, into the, into the Thunderbird. As he travels, uh, how we know it's first of all that we know it's a, a shaman is, uh, and, and we know it's very powerful is when you look at the hair up in here. On the image, you'll see that it's a top knot. A long time ago, uh, traditional medicine men, uh, particularly in the plains, used to keep their medicine bundles in their hair, and they were called top knots. And within that, they would keep their herbs and medicines, and it would always be with them. Uh, so even when you go back to some of the early uh, uh, Indian Jesus Christ uh, imagery, you'll see the uh, the top knots are there, uh, and those are depicting a individual of power. A shaman. So uh, within here, in all of the figures, you'll see variations of the top knot and the power that is contained therein. You'll also see within the uh, transformations, you'll see the he's drawing from various sources of power. In this case, you'll see an image of a sun, and you'll see the direct communication lines that travel from the sun to his top knot and coming into his, uh, into his physical presence or his body, depicting that he is drawing power and connecting power uh, for that transformation from the sun. The other one here would be uh, a moon. And so it's, it's the daylight, darkness, good, evil, that whole balance that the shaman needs because really the transformation is, is a very delicate process of, of balance. Um, and so he's drawing his various powers from there. Also, again, you can see uh, the arms themselves actually transforming into birds' wings as you go through the imagery. But you'll also, again, notice the importance of the um, sky world, middle world, and underworld. The shaman being in the middle world, you'll see the sky world depicted with the birds and with the uh, astral uh, planetary configurations of the sun and the moon and also you'll see the underworld and you'll see the underworld being depicted in the lower portion by the fish so it's telling us that this shaman has the ability to tra and is drawing power and has the ability to transgress uh, these m multiple realities which one needs to do for healing um, and also needs to draw upon uh, the power of the totems and animals that would allow him to garner all of that uh, that power that he is seeking. And as we go through it, you'll see the, the, the full transformation taking. You'll, again, you'll see the, the smaller objects uh, that again are um, uh, the, the balance, the split, sun, moon, night, day, good, evil. All of those are depicted in those split images. And the shaman again is pulling that power from there. You'll see medicine bundles, as he garners that power, you'll see the, the fish moving and transforming into um, the shaman. And then finally, he makes his complete full transformation. And in the very, very last panel, we know that he's attained that power because we can see here the full communication and connection line through all of the objects that uh, surround him. And all of these are now part of the shaman and his, 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 his transformation and power is complete, all connected with these lines of power.